on a hillside of an arid grassland. A small group of people sat around a single campfire. It was late evening, but the sun still lit the sky on this cool summer day. Resting after a successful hunt and subsequent butchery of a large horse, this band enjoyed their full stomachs, the warmth of the fire, and the view of the sun lowering toward the distant horizon. But not all were idle. One woman sat cross-legged on top of a soft horse hide, amidst a scatter of equipment made from stone, antler, bone, and leather. Tapping at a piece of chert deliberately with a bone hammer, she removed flakes. The stone was narrow, about as long as her hand, and shaped like a boat, with a flat top and rounded bottom. Similarly shaped core stones could be found among the belongings of every adult in that camp. The preparation complete, she next wrapped the chert in a small piece of leather and supported it against her left leg. After abrading the narrow end of the core with another stone, she pressed the pointy end of a deer antler against the edge with as much force as her body could produce. The edge of the core gave way, and a tiny blade, only three centimeters long, was released from the core. She set this microblade aside, placed the antler slightly to the right, and repeated the process, producing a nearly identical product. In about one minute, she worked her way back and forth across the narrow end of the core, making a couple dozen microblades which would become the sharp new cutting edge of her knife, used to fillet meat. Identical microblades were components of all spear points and knives used by her band. Having weapons and tools in tip-top condition, ready when needed, was essential. She pulled the old dull microblades from a groove in a finely crafted and polished bone knife handle. Snapping off the ends of the new microblades, she produced rectangles and one by one slid them into the empty slot, creating a perfectly straight, long blade, ready to slice through the next animal their band killed. This woman lived 25,000 years ago, near the Yellow River of northern China. The pressure technique for producing microblades that she used was perhaps the most influential invention of the Paleolithic in this region, and over the next 5,000 years would be adopted by most people living in Northeast Asia. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 33, Microblades. Up until 25,000 years ago, several distinctive cultures populated Northeast Asia. The Gobi Desert marked an especially prominent cultural boundary, with stone blade-dependent societies on the Asian steppe and flake-focused cultures in northern China. A genetic distinction even existed between people on either side of the Gobi. However, after 25,000 years ago, this diverse landscape would be transformed as a powerful new technology broke through social and geographic barriers. During this period of change, migrations altered the genetic makeup of Northeast Asia, and groups of people using a new type of stone tool appeared in Siberia, northern China, Japan, and Korea, creating a more homogeneous cultural region. These tools are known as microblades, 
one of the most impactful inventions made during the Paleolithic age. Their spread occurred rapidly and marked a key turning point in Asian prehistory. Microblades, as the name suggests, were remarkably tiny, less than 7 millimeters wide, between 2 and 7 centimeters long, and less than 3 millimeters thick. Microlithization had affected many parts of Africa and Eurasia since the spread of Homo sapiens, but these tools marked the most extreme expression of this global trend. Last episode, we learned about the spread of bladelets across Eurasia around 40,000 years ago. Even though bladelets and microblades are similar in shape and even overlap somewhat in size, Archaeologists consider them to be distinct technologies, due to differences in the methods used to produce them. Microblades can be thought of as refined versions of bladelets. Besides being smaller than most bladelets, their shape was more standardized, their long edges being nearly perfectly parallel to each other. This characteristic was key to their usefulness. Microblades were inserts, slotted into narrow grooves carved in wood, bone, antler, or ivory. The consistent shape and size of these tiny stone tools allowed people to create smooth and straight cutting edges from multiple microblades. Given the explosive spread of this technology, microblade armed implements must have provided significant benefits over tools made from blades or bladelets. Depending on the shape of the support and the arrangement of the microblades, different types of tools and weapons could be created. In Northeast Asia around 25,000 years ago, it's thought that microblades were primarily used to add a sharp cutting edge to spear points made from bone or antler although there's some evidence that there were also components of knives. Amazingly, intact spear points with microblade inserts have been discovered at Paleolithic sites in Siberia. Dagger-shaped, they bore either one or two rows of microblades along most of the length of the point. Even though microblade-armed spear points eventually became extremely common, their invention required the development of several new stoneworking techniques. The most central of these is called pressure flaking, which is the removal of flakes from a core by pressing a tool, usually a pointy tip of an antler, against the edge of the stone. Although pressure flaking can't detach large pieces, this technique allows precise control over the location where the force is applied more so than when swinging a hammer against the core. Greater control results in more standardized products. Whereas bladelets were removed from cores with bone hammers, microblades were removed with pressure flakers. You might recall that pressure flaking has made two previous appearances in our exploration of prehistory. Once in southern Africa, around 70,000 years ago, during the Still Bay culture, and once in Europe around 25,000 years ago during the Salutrian culture. However, in both those cases, pressure flaking was not used to make microblades or bladelets, but to shape highly symmetrical leaf-shaped stone points. The invention of microblades in Asia involved more than the realization by stoneworkers that they could remove flakes with pressure. They also had to figure out which shape of coarse stone produced microblades. It seems that this process involved a period of experimentation before a limited set of optimized shapes became entrenched in microblade cultures. These were prepared by a series of specific steps and included cores shaped like wedges, boats, pyramids, and cones. Different microblade core types would come to define different regions of Northeast Asia. Once the core was prepared, 
people could remove dozens of microblades of similar size and shape with few alterations to the core. Pressure flaking microblades can be done by hand without special gear besides the antler pressure flaker. However, modern experiments have shown that by using different pieces of equipment to immobilize the core and to increase the amount of force applied, larger microblades can be produced. Given the size of some microblades made during the Paleolithic, archaeologists argue that in some cases specialized equipment was used. The combination of pressure flaking and microblade core preparation unleashed a revolution in hunting weaponry. Once invented, microblades spread widely, reaching most of northern China, Korea, Japan, and Siberia by 20,000 years ago, and remained in use for more than 10,000 years. People of this period were looking for ways to create more standardized bladelets. The wide-ranging presence of microblades suggests that people saw them as a major improvement over preceding technologies. To further understand this cultural transformation, we need to explore its origin and spread. The environmental context of these events may provide clues to the power of these tiny tools, which ended up transcending cultural divisions that had stood for more than 10,000 years. The invention of microblades is shrouded in uncertainty. It used to be a common opinion that southern Siberia was the homeland of this technology. As we saw last episode, bladelets became increasingly common in that wider region after 35,000 years ago. Some of the cores used to produce those bladelets even resembled microblade cores, and in some cases may have been pressure flaked. However, currently, most archaeologists believe that the bladelets of southern Siberia made before 25,000 years ago, and the methods used to make them, lacked the regularity that would come later, and thus were not true microblades. Instead, the inhabitants of the Siberian steppe may have played an indirect role in microblade development by spreading their practice of making bladelets to China. The most recent archaeological research has landed on the idea that formal microblade cores and pressure flaking were invented either in northern China or in Korea, sometime between 30,000 and 26,000 years ago. During this period, people using blades and bladelets similar to those of the Siberian Middle Upper Paleolithic appeared in northern China, in the Yellow River Basin, and in the mountains of Manchuria. It's thought that a southward migration of people around the eastern edge of the Gobi Desert imported these customs. The arrival of blade and bladelets in China occurred as the world was approaching the last glacial maximum. By 30,000 years ago, Northeast Asia was already becoming colder which may have prompted a southward movement of human bands. The bladelets used by these groups still lacked the standardization that would come later, but once in China, Middle Upper Paleolithic traditions underwent an evolution. By 26,000 years ago, microblade cores and pressure flaking were being expertly employed. The relationship between these developments in China and the appearance of microblades in Korea at the same time is not clear. In fact, the earliest date for true microblades in Korea is 29,000 years ago, older than those in China. During this initial phase of development, people using microblades were surrounded by other groups using old types of stone tools. In Korea, that was blades and tanged points, in northern China, that was simple core and flake tools. That would change after 25,000 years ago, when microblade technology went from its incipient 
to its mature stage of development. By this date, variation in microblade core shape had decreased as people settled on specific napping sequences for their preparation. With the development of formalized cores, microblades appeared in a new region, the Russian Sakhalin Peninsula, which at the time was connected to the Japanese island of Hokkaido. Furthermore, around 25,000 years ago, another defining tool of microblade cultures was adopted. These were sturdy chisels, primarily used to carve grooves in bone or wood, into which microblades were slotted. Known as Araya burns, they had a standardized shape with straight retouched edges and diagonal tips. Across Northeast Asia, Araya burns became essential elements of most toolkits, which also included other large tools, such as end scrapers. With the appearance of true microblades, two cultural variants emerged, defined by different types of microblade cores. In the Northeast, in Hokkaido, Korea, and Manchuria, the most common core was wedge-shaped. On the other hand, in the Southwest, around the Yellow River, pyramid and boat-shaped cores were preferred. These types required smaller stones and a simpler preparation than the wedge variant in the Northeast. This division within the microblade world would remain in place for thousands of years, and might be explained by the types of raw materials available in these regions. Manchuria, Hokkaido, and Korea, where wedge-shaped cores were made, all have sources of obsidian, a resource that is absent around the Yellow River. People in the Northeast collected this volcanic glass, which was ideal for making microblades, in the mountains and carried it hundreds of kilometers. The abundance of obsidian in this part of East Asia is often cited by archaeologists as a potential factor facilitating the invention of microblades. Another catalyst may have been the climate. The emergence of the mature microblade toolkit with standardized cores and araya burns, coincided with the peak of the last ice age. Around 25,000 years ago, in North China, there was an increase in dust deposition as arid biomes expanded. Cold-tolerant coniferous trees, like spruce and fir, replaced temperate deciduous species, and horses became more common than deer. The extreme conditions of the last glacial maximum dramatically impacted the human populations of the region. In Siberia, Mongolia, and northern China, evidence of human activity decreased between 25,000 and 20,000 years ago. Hunter-gatherers even seem to have completely abandoned some regions for several thousand years, including Mongolia and parts of Manchuria and southern Siberia. As temperatures plummeted, 42 degrees north latitude became an important environmental boundary. This was the southern limit of the permafrost, where the ground remained frozen year-round, making conditions for plant and animal life much more extreme. North of this line, which runs through northern China, human groups mostly died or migrated. South of this threshold lays the Yellow River and the Korean Peninsula, which both served as refuges for humans during this global cooling. Further north, the Hokkaido Peninsula, whose maritime-influenced climate remained milder than that of the continent, also maintained a stable human population. The early appearance of microblade technology in three regions that supported human survival during the last glacial maximum might hold the key to explaining the forces that led to their adoption. It's likely that as plants and animals dwindled, people in Korea, the Yellow River Basin, and Hokkaido concentrated around the remaining resources in pockets of increasing population density. 
prehistorians have proposed that it was these stressful environmental and social conditions which created the impetus to experiment with new methods of producing stone tools, perhaps searching for more effective hunting weapons. This scenario has parallels to the last glacial maximum of Europe. At a time when Northern Europe was abandoned, people surviving in the refuge of Southern France and Iberia adopted radically different hunting weapons. This was the transition from the Gravettian to the Salutrian, when antler spear points with blade-lit inserts were discarded in favor of elaborately produced stone spear points including the classic leaf-shaped laurels. Interestingly, at both ends of Eurasia, the contraction of the human population into southern havens was associated with a technological transformation. But the hunting weapons that emerged from those changes ended up being strikingly different. After the emergence of true microblade cultures, their customs would spread over an enormous area. Around 25,000 years ago, groups of hunter-gatherers in Hokkaido, Korea, and a large part of northern China produced microblades. But this practice was not universal. At that point, microblade makers coexisted with other people using older types of tools. It would be over the course of the next 5,000 years, during the run of the last glacial maximum, that tools and weapons made from microblades spread extensively out from their homeland, and preceding technologies mostly disappeared. This process began around 23,000 years ago, when wedge-shaped cores and microblades appeared in parts of Siberia that are nearest to Manchuria. This includes the river valleys of Far East Russia and those surrounding Lake Baikal. This might represent a northward expansion of people who recolonized portions of Siberia, surprisingly even before the end of the last glacial maximum, perhaps during relatively mild climatic episodes. The expansion of microblades accelerated at the end of the last glacial maximum as the human population rebounded. Around 20,000 years ago, microblades appeared in Paleo Honshu, the largest of the Japanese islands. Here, regional stone point varieties had continued to dominate instead of microblades throughout the last glacial maximum. In the south of this island, microblades were made from pyramid cores, and in the north, from wedge cores, suggesting a dual transmission of the new stone napping techniques from people living along the Yellow River and Hokkaido, respectively. Also, around 20,000 years ago, the wedge cores continued their spread across Siberia, reaching the Altai Mountains in the west. Interestingly, the spread of cultural ideas from China to the Eurasian steppe, from east to west, is the opposite of the pattern in preceding periods. The initial Upper Paleolithic and the middle Upper Paleolithic had both spread from west to east, eventually reaching China. This shift may reflect a change in the predominant direction of human migration during different periods. A few thousand years later, Mongolia would be recolonized by people using microblades. As the extreme cold finally relented, microblade cultures reached the Arctic region of Far East Russia. By 14,000 years ago, people using wedge cores had crossed the Bering Land Bridge between Asia and America, appearing first in Alaska and later on along the Pacific coast of Canada. Used by tribes and people on two different continents, the weapons and tools made from microblades were truly powerful innovations during this stage of human history. However, there were some cultural boundaries that they did not transcend. Microblades would not spread south of the 33rd parallel into southern China, or west of the Ural Mountains, 
and their entry into Central Asia from Siberia was delayed, only reaching Kazakhstan around 10,000 years ago. Despite these limits, by the end of the last glacial maximum, the microblade revolution had swept through all of Northeast Asia. As with other key events, prehistorians try to determine to what degree this phenomenon represents the migration of people bearing this new technology, and to what extent they replaced the preceding inhabitants. As we have seen, the origin and spread of microblades was a complex process, taking place in multiple stages, possibly involving different mechanisms. In some places, experts point out that old types of tools, like small scrapers along the Yellow River, survived and were used alongside microblades, suggesting that the preceding inhabitants and makers of core and flake tools survived to some extent. On the other hand, genetic evidence from the Paleolithic provides other evidence that the spread of microblade cultures coincided with population movements. In previous episodes, we learned that the initial Homo sapiens inhabitants of northern China and Siberia represented distinct genetic populations, which I referred to as possessing Tianwan and ancient Siberian ancestries, respectively. These groups lived in Northeast Asia up until the last glacial maximum. However, by the end of this cold phase, by 19,000 years ago, the ancient DNA belonging to people living in these places was substantially different from the older populations, suggesting the arrival or expansion of different genetic groups. In northern China, the new inhabitants were more closely related to modern-day northern Chinese than the Tianwan population had been. We don't know where these ancient North Chinese came from, but they replaced the Tianwan population during the last glacial maximum. In Siberia, a similar turnover took place, although in this case we have a better understanding of what happened. Groups of people related to the ancient North Chinese moved northward from East Asia to Siberia and mixed with remnant groups of ancient Siberians. This process of mixing created a new population, which came to dominate eastern Siberia, and which geneticists have named Ancient Paleo-Siberians. The oldest ancient Paleo-Siberian that has been discovered lived in the Yakutia region of Far East Russia about 17,000 years ago. This person's ancestry was 80% related to the newly arrived East Asians and only 20% related to the previous occupants of Siberia. Importantly, ancient Paleo-Siberians have been found to be direct ancestors of most Native Americans. The takeaway from ancient DNA is that certain groups in Northeast Asia expanded migrated and replaced or mixed with other genetic lineages during the last glacial maximum, the same period that microblades were spreading. It's likely that these dominant groups carried microblades. Interestingly, it was during this time of cultural and genetic change that certain genes became widespread. One of these is the EDAR mutation which bestows thicker hair, a common trait among modern East Asians. Given the archaeological and genetic data, the spread of microblades probably involved both migrations of people and the transmission of this technology through social contacts between neighboring groups. The strong appeal of this innovative practice must be understood in the environmental context in which it rose to prominence. Microblades were invented and spread as the region grew increasingly covered by cold, dry grasslands, shrubby steppe, and tundra, and as food became more sparsely distributed. It's theorized that during the last glacial maximum, people in Northeast Asia adopted quite mobile lifeways, 
to cope with these new circumstances. We see this mobility in the long-distance transportation of obsidian, sometimes more than 800 kilometers. Long trips between campsites are not uncommon by hunter-gatherer bands living in open Arctic environments. Furthermore, there is a strong association between open landscapes and microblade technology. It's notable that they did not spread to southern China, which remained primarily covered in forest during the last glacial maximum. High mobility in open landscapes may have contributed to the speed with which standardized microblade cores first spread. If these societies coped with the increasingly harsh environment by moving long distances in search of food, what made microblades so useful in that situation? One advantage of these tiny stone tools was their portability. Microblades could be napped from smaller blocks of stone than other types of tools, convenient for habitual travelers. Cores could be prepared before moving, easily carried between campsites, and napped whenever hunting weapons or knives needed to be repaired. Another advantage of microblades may have been their impact on hunting weapon effectiveness. Based on experiments with reconstructions of prehistoric weapons, spear points made from antler and armed with rows of sharp microblades might be the most reliable type of hunting projectile made during the Paleolithic. This is because they combine the lethality of stone points with the durability of antler points. Microblades cause significant amounts of bleeding when penetrating animal flesh, increasing the chance that a strike will be fatal. In addition, the antler foundation breaks less often than a stone point, increasing its reusability. The major downside to antler spear points armed with microblades is the investment required to produce them. Since they consisted of multiple elements that had to be crafted and then assembled, making this weapon required a greater amount of skill, knowledge, and time than other types of projectiles. According to this logic, we can look at the adoption of microblades as a case of increasing technological complexity, perhaps driven by the harshness of the last glacial maximum. When living in environments where the consequences of failure, such as a failed hunt, are higher because resources are scarcer, hunter-gatherers tend to invest more in technology. Some of the most sophisticated hunter-gatherer toolkits are those of people living today in the Arctic. As we have seen, the last glacial maximum had dramatic effects on the course of Northeast Asian prehistory human populations contracted and rebounded, shifting the genetic makeup of this region. Those people who survived adopted new technologies and an increasingly mobile lifeway. Culturally, Siberia, the Yellow River Basin, Korea, and Japan grew to be much more similar than ever before. Unlike the Salutrian stone points, which fell out of use as soon as the worst of the cold ended, microblades possessed a greater staying power, demonstrating the value that people attributed to these tiny stone tools. In our next episode, we will approach the end of the Pleistocene and explore the extremely unique evolution of Northeast Asian societies as the climate warmed and food resources became more diverse. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.